Ok. Bueno, pues hola, hola a todas, a todos. De parte de, de Avaloquita les damos la bienvenida a esta charla que vamos a tener con una, una amiga, una artista que queremos mucho y que admiramos mucho también. Y, y como todas las charlas, pensamos que, que su trabajo, además de que es increíble y ya lo van a conocer, puede ser de, de mucho beneficio para ustedes. Y bueno, con todo el amor que les tenemos eh, y que le tenemos a Kate, pues eh, vamos a dar inicio a esta charla. Les voy a, a hablar un poquito de, de Kate. Kate eh, vive y, y trabaja en Montreal. Su trabajo se centra en los animales y los seres humanos, concretamente en la utilización de los primeros por los segundos en la representación y ejercicio del poder. Su trabajo es principalmente escultórico eh, de dibujo y eh, mezcla la taxidermia en su práctica. Con estos medios lleva a cabo una especie de teatro mitológico en el que coinciden lo bello y lo grotesco y en el que se pueden exponer y examinar las convenciones humanas de poder y de violencia. Eh, Kate eh, va, va a hablar un poco de su trabajo. La conversación va a ser en inglés. Va a haber una... Eh, subtítulo eh, simultáneo que nos va a hacer favor Marcela de hacerlo y para que lo puedan eh, acceder a la parte de los subtítulos tienen que ir a la parte de abajo de su pantallita y poner activar subtítulos entonces ahí van a poder leer eh, los subtítulos en cuanto que te esté hablando cualquier cosa si no pueden entrar o lo que sea escríbanos por el chat y, y les podemos les podemos ayudar eh, en cualquier cosa que necesiten. Y, y bueno, eso, bienvenidas. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, Kate, welcome. Eh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Eh, it's really, really an honor for us to have you in this, in this space. And También. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Gracias. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have been invited to do this artist talk. Um, I, I'm so impressed by Avalakita and what's happening actually in Mexico and the art world in general there. So it's just a pleasure to be a participant. Um, so well, let's, let's get moving. So Hold on, let me see if I can actually get this working. One second. Oh, there, okay, there we go. Um, so just a brief introduction about who I am. Um, I am a human animal. Um, I was born in 1983 in Alberta, Canada, which is Western part of Canada. Um, but I moved around a lot. My parents were journalists and they were hippies. And, In the photos, the only difference between my father and my mom is his long beard because they both had very long hair and smoked a lot of pot and were very curious activists and uh, writers and very engaged with the world. So we moved around a lot. We moved to where I lived in, around Canada. I lived in Toronto and Ottawa. I lived on the East Coast and for a short time up north uh, in the Northwest Territories. When I decided to go to university, I studied at Concordia in Montreal. I fell in love with Montreal because of the culture. It was a clashing of Francophone and Anglophone communities. There was a political tension uh, that existed and it was a very vibrant city. It excited, it excited me. Um, So in university I studied, I couldn't decide what to do, but I, I loved the arts. I loved painting and drawing. So I, I did a fine arts degree, but I also studied theology because I've also always had a keen interest in religion and myth and the history of storytelling. Um, after I graduated from Concordia, I, I was working as a caregiver for, with people with uh, physical and mental disabilities. 
and also pursuing an art practice. So nights going to my studio and painting and drawing. And my work, as you will see, it eventually led me to pursue taxidermy. And to do that, I went and did a course in taxidermy where I became a certified taxidermist, but I also studied with taxidermists around the world. Um, and just a few years ago, I went back to Concordia and completed my master's in fine arts in sculpture. Um, I have a little quote here that I wrote, but it's, it's really talking about my childhood. Um, growing up, I was a bit of a daydreamer, but I always felt this incredible connection to other animals, to the natural world. I would spend my days collecting bugs and naming them. Um, one of my first memories is, you know, screaming at my father to pull the car over so that I could poke at a dead porcupine on the side of the road. And I remember, you know, turning it over with a stick and just looking at this inert body on the side of the road and uh, actually, uh, part of that memory was that afterwards, uh, it wasn't my father, I was, with, I was with a friend's father, he took a saw out of his car and he sawed off one of the paws of this porcupine and I, I took it home with me because I just thought it was so fascinating. Um, my mom was a little bit horrified, I think, when I came home with a dead paw, but that's where my curiosity began um, and an incredible emotionality and sensitivity to life and to death. Um, I think from an early age, I understood that sentient life is not just human, it's, uh, it's all around us. And that has, that has absolutely uh, been, you know, the foundation of my art practice. Um, so, I mean, this, this is my artist statement. I'm not sure if it's, uh, well, no, I, I will read it. I will read it for you. Uh, my work concerns animals and humans, specifically the use of the former by the latter in the representation and exercise of power. I work chiefly in drawing and sculpture, but the artisanal techniques of taxidermy are central to my practice. With these media, I create a sort of mythological theater where the beautiful and the grotesque co-mingle and where human conventions of power and violence can be exposed and examined. Hunted and mutilated in life, embalmed and posed for display and death, in our society, the bodies of animals are enlisted, reanimated and made to play various roles in a grotesque human-centered theater that serves to sanction or whitewash human, especially male, power and violence. In such roles, animals may be remained, sorry, reanimated as companions, objects of desire, victims of violence, jesters, or comical figures or trophies. As such, animal bodies easily stand in for human ones, the bodies of women, immigrants, people of color, or others who are threatened or marginalized by power. And I'm going to get into this a little bit further as I explain my work, because I realize this is it's a pretty dense statement. Um, it is important for me to note that the animals that I use in my work are found animals. I find them on roadsides or um, sometimes they've been donated by veterinary clinics or even by friends who have handed on their domestic pets. Um, this is key to my practice. I do not kill uh, in the name of art. Um, so I'm going to move on here. Um, so before I began sculptural work, taxidermy, I, I had been a painter. I was actually a portrait painter for many years, um, but it just wasn't singing to me. And I remember one day I, I was also an avid traveler. I think I was in the Southern I don't know, the desert somewhere in the States. And 
I pulled the car over to look at a, a dead animal on the side of the road. And it was lying on this dry desert sand. And isolated on that sand, if I looked at it from above, it looked like the animal was almost in a state of ecstasy or, 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 or as if it was floating. And it, it actually harked back. It made me think of Robert Longo's series, drawing series, Men in Cities, which was a series of, of men and women in business attire jumping up on a white background. And they kind of take on this air as if they're floating. So I, I just snapped a picture of this animal and I went back to the studio and I drew the animal on a white surface, large format, and it looked again like it was transcending this world as if it were floating or in a state of ecstasy. And thus began the series of drawings that I called La Danse Macabre. And La Danse Macabre, essentially it's, a, it's the dance of death. And the allegory is that we all do the dance of death. And no matter our station in life, so you might be poor, you might be a king, you might be, I don't know, a prisoner. In death, everyone is equal. Everyone does the dance of death. And so this was this series that I started. Large charcoal drawings, of, they vary from about six to eight feet in height. I'll show you some more. Um, hold on, I'm just gonna. So here we have, right, we've got Bruno, a dog on the left here and a cat. Bruno, I feel has the sense of floating, whereas this cat to me seems to be falling. We have a quail, which I called leap of faith, as it looks as if it's leaping forward. Um, and on the right is a charcoal caiman, um, which are very small, um, Oh, I think they're in the crocodile. No, they're alligator family, I believe, but very small um, creatures that I was given as a gift, actually. Um, this guy traveled from the States to get to Montreal for me. Um, and then here, this was a seagull that I found in Montreal outside of a Jewish bakery. Um, but again, these animals, to me, they have this sense of, of floating or as if they're, they're in ecstasy. Moving with this series, so hold on, I'm just, uh, yeah, um, I, was, I was drawing these animals and it started that I was taking photographs, but then it, it wasn't enough, so I started to to collect the animals and take them into my studio. It was much easier to draw them from life. Um, and as I was doing that, it always seemed a shame that at the end of it, I was putting them in a bag and dumping them outside. Um, at the time I had a studio close to some railroad tracks and I would <laughs> dig holes by the railroad tracks and bury these, these animals that I had drawn in studio but it still didn't feel like enough. I wanted, to, I wanted to go further. And that's what prompted me to move into taxidermy. Um, and the images you're seeing now are part of the process of, of taxidermy, which I'm going to get into later on. Um, but you can see the skin is being revealed. So the black and white is now being shed and you have the color of the actual body that's being uh, freed from the skin. And this was a series of three cats. Um, so just talking about, I mean, part of my, I believe all artists are researchers um, and there are some that perhaps veer more towards the academic research. There are others that are just that research through materials with their hands um, and others who, well, I think like me, I have a bit of a journalistic approach to my art. I really uh, 
I start from a subject matter, which to me is the animal, which is a very open-ended subject. And from there, there are various questions and points of inquiry that I, that I can then delve into. Um, and I just love this quote. This was from the year 2000. So I realize it's now 22 years old, but it's, it's been interesting to see how animals have reemerged in the last few decades both in art as well as in uh, pop culture. So you'll notice, at least I've noticed here up in Canada, you know, you'll often see deer on t-shirts. Um, people have started to collect taxidermy, uh, I don't know, sweatshirts with bears. Um, so the non-human animal has come back into our, into our culture and society. Um, and I can't tell if this is something to be celebrated that perhaps we're now recognizing the non-human animal or if it's in some way paying tribute to these other sentient beings that are literally dying around us because we're also living in a time of incredible climate change and we're watching species disappear daily. So. I, I question that, I question that revival. But it's been interesting see, seeing the ways that animals have come back in the art world. And uh, I'm one of those players. Um, so these are some questions of interest to me. Um, so one of which is why the shift from merely representing animals as we've seen back in the day, still life, et cetera. Uh, in art, using them as a subject, as an object, and as a collaborator. We saw Joseph Boys um, do his, his performance installation with a, wolf, a coyote uh, years ago. That was a collab, an an non-human animal collaborator. What does this signify about our cultural and environmental landscape? Um, and in order to discuss or understand the animal, that includes the human animal and our relationship to other animals, how important is it that we relate to the biologically active animal? So is it something that is inherent to our, to our physical scientific connection or is there more there? Um, what is humanness? What are the limits of our consciousness? And how much of our experience do we share with other species? And this is, I, this one I find very fascinating. Is the contemporary animal a human construction? So if so, is it relevant to become animal when becoming animal in today's world means becoming an organism that is built by humans? What does animal mean anymore? Um, and does becoming animal merely mean facing our uneasiness with being animal? Um, this is something that really that I find incredibly curious. We are so quick as a species to separate ourselves from other animal life. To, we are humans. We're not human animals, we're humans. And yet um, that separation from this animality, it's created a separation from the world and ultimately even within our species. And I believe has been a large uh, contributor to the detriment of this planet. We speak um, so freely about how we're, we're killing other species, we're destroying the planet, but we're ultimately killing ourselves in the process. And I, I believe that's because there's a disconnection, there's a disconnection from that animality, from that symbiosis or Gaia, as you would put it, which is that we are part of a whole of other, other beings. Um, so taxidermy. Uh, taxidermy is, uh, well, it says it's the art of preparing, stuffing, and mounting the skin of animals. It literally means taxidermy. It means a rearrangement of skin. And it's, to me, it's, uh, 
it's one of the most fascinating mediums I've ever gotten involved with because it's not just, well, because of the ways that it has been used in, in our history. Um, the earliest taxidermy was done by explorers, European explorers, who of course crossed the seas and went to foreign countries and killed a bunch of humans and uh, other animals, and then wanted to bring back these specimens so that they could show off in their, in their European country, all of the wonders of the world. Um, but of course the voyage across the ocean was quite long. And so they had to think of a way to preserve these exotic species and hence early taxidermy uh, began, which was literally taking the skin off, pulling out the inner body and then stuffing it, literally stuffing it with straw um, and that's why now when you think of, often people think of tax, taxidermy and they think of stuffing an animal, which is no longer the process, but it was the, the earliest beginnings. And a little anecdote, um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with some of the earliest encyclopedias, but you know, these were, <laughs> I think we've seen it in the, in the history of art, an artist trying to depict a lion and the lion is like cross-eyed and it, it doesn't look at all like a lion. And that's because they were going by either somebody's description of seeing a lion in their, in their voyage, or perhaps it was a specimen that was brought back and just not brought back properly. Um, but one great entry in, in one of the earliest encyclopedias was an entry about these birds that didn't have any legs. They were legless birds. And of course, everyone was completely miffed by these birds that had no legs. Really what had happened was the, the people who were bringing these birds back, they had cut the legs off to save space in the ship. And so by the time the birds arrived to Europe, whoever was documenting it in the encyclopedia thought, my goodness, we've discovered these legless birds. Um, so in that sense, the history of taxidermy is really interesting because it started as a way of documenting, of um, categorizing, of learning. It also came with it uh, death and, and uh, human selfishness in that sense. Um, Taxidermy since then, I mean, so it has its, its natural science history, but now we also have hunting culture where taxidermy is really, it's about finding the biggest and best, most magnificent creature, shooting it, killing it, and then bringing it home to then put on one's wall as a display of possession and ownership. So this animal that was once in the wild becomes a symbol of domination and possession. Um, and then of course, we also have people who, for example, they want to taxidermy their pets. Um, there have been some instances also of human taxidermy. And to me, that speaks of the, the human animal's desire to stop death, to try to halt the process or try to reinvigorate life, bring it back in some way. So all of these, all of these facets and sides of taxidermy are so engaging to me and speak so much to human hubris and the way we interact on this planet and have for centuries. Um, so the process of taxidermy is uh, the initial process is to flesh the animal, which is that you separate the skin from the body. And uh, the skin is attached by I'm doing this with my sweater because it, it's almost like that you lift and then you kind of detach sinews from the body um, as if it's taking off a sock off of your foot. Uh, once the skin is removed, then it needs to be cleaned. 
and then the body is set aside and that skin has to go through a tanning process which is it's it's the skin is essentially it's a mutable material which means it's going to disintegrate unless it's made into a stable material and that's what the process of tanning does is it basically turns the skin into a leather which means it won't disintegrate over time and that is a whole chemical process afterwards you have to mount it's called mounting where the skin is then placed onto an armature or a body that has been recreated in the form of the original body the skin is put back onto it it's a synthetic body of course now it's often done with polyurethane foam or there's still an older method of wrapping uh, a wire structure with burlap the skin is placed back on this body eyes are put in glass eyes of course and then greatest detail is made to make ensuring that the eyes the eyelids are tucked in the lips um, nowadays you can get fake gums and teeth and ears and um, and then great effort is put into adding detail to then sew the skin finish the animal and display it it's a long process and taxidermists nowadays have gotten quite advanced. Some will even recreate the septum in a nose, or you can see the inner cartilage of an ear. Every, sometimes a little drop of tear near the, the eye ducts. So much effort is placed into recreating life, into making this animal look alive. So I've touched on this already, but why taxidermy? I'm going to, I'll just go over it briefly. Um, for me, I mean, a, a, an important part is that it, it is, uh, at least in my process, it, you cannot at all escape the confrontation with death. You're, I'm working hands-on with something that was once alive that is now dead. Um, and in doing so, I can't help but then face my own mortality every time I'm working with an animal. Um, it's, I think, an, a symbol of, as I said, possession, dominance, control. Um, it's a natural history curiosity. And uh, ultimately, I think, is an indicator of the human animal's power or domination over, over nature. Um, so I'm back to the research. So as I've said, you know, it's the subject, the medium and the process dictate my research. Um, I, I think having grown up with two parents who were journalists, that definitely, uh, it colored the way that I approached my artwork. And so, so much of my experience is in the process. It's in the experiences I've lived. And then the final product is the sculpture or the drawing, but it, there's so much to get to that point. Um, so some of these experiences I've had in the taxiderm world have been, I did apprenticeships with taxidermists in Canada, in the UK, in Austria, as well as in Italy. And I also attended the taxidermy world championships. Um, which I did not know existed um, until I was there uh, shadowing the judges. I was their secretary. And you can imagine so that they're held in the United States and most years, every three years they're in Europe. And the ones in the United States, it's just, it's like a football stadium of taxidermy, of dead animals posed in lifelike or saccharine, very sweet uh, poses, you know, I, I think once I saw like a fox reading the Bible, <laughs> it was very anthropomorphic, but very American. And these judges, they, they walk around and they criticize every tail of these mounts. They see if the ears are aligned for the birds, if the feathers lie properly. Um, and what struck me is that in all of this effort, in this stadium of dead animals, 
taking notes, making sure there's as lifelike as possible. What struck me the most was that it was a futile task that no matter how hard these taxidermists worked, the end result, it was futile because these animals were dead. They lack movement, they lack breath. And I kind of understood why many taxidermists late in life actually suffer from depression because it's like working towards something that, that is futile, ultimately futile but a really interesting experience on my end. Um, this is a photo series I did of just some of the, the creatures that I was collecting. Um, I ended up, I now have two freezers in my studio um, so that I can collect and keep the roadkill that I find. Um, hold on. So it's just, Again, it's looking at we're all, that we're all we're all made of of flesh and blood, some covered in feathers, some in fur. Um, this, of course, is a cat. You can see the photo on the left, the cat's jaw. That's part of the separation, the fleshing. This is a coyote. The eye on the left is the finished taxidermy product. That's a glass eye. Um, and that again is the separation of the flesh, the skin from the actual structure of the, the body, the bone. Um, this is a raccoon, a raccoon paw next to a cat that had been euthanized, a friend's cat um, that she then passed on to me. Um, so dioramas. Dioramas are, um, I think many of us have seen them in museums. Uh, it's not just, of course, the animal on display. It's the entire environment has been recreated. Um, and so this began in the Victorian era um, in the 1800s. Uh, New York was kind of the leader, New York and London in, in dioramas. So there were great safari hunts, uh, elephants and lions were brought back. And then these massive dioramas were created um, to then house these taxidermy animals. So that not only were we looking at the animal looking lifelike, but it was also in its natural setting. Um, the word literally means through that which is seen. Um, so through and uh, orama site. Um, this is, so this was called Sensa Terra Nutria. Uh, this was an installation that I did at the Museum of Zoology in Rome. My work is on the right. It's the three floating animals. Um, I've got, hold on. So the, this is a detail of the, of the animals. Um, so these are called nutria and nutria, um, hold on, I'm just going to go back to the previous, here it is. So nutria were animals that were brought from South America. Uh, they were brought to Italy for use in the fur trade. And of course, people didn't actually love the fur and they ended up releasing them in the wild and the nutria took over and became an invasive species. So they were eating other wildlife, they were living in wetlands and eroding the soil. Um, and Italians loathe them, they cannot stand nutria. They're considered a pest, they're an invasive species. Similarly, in Italy, there is almost the same reaction to immigrants. So people who arrive from other countries who are needed actually in, they've been welcomed, they do the jobs that most people don't want to do, but there is a certain um, distaste or, or hatred for the other, for immigrants. Senza terra, senza terra in Italian literally means without ground, without earth. It's a deterioralized tea, Deterritorialization, which means these animals no longer fit here or there. They're in a, a liminal space. 
And, and so that's what I represented. And I placed these animals in a museum setting, as I'll show you again. So it was among the other museum uh, displays. Um, and again, like the drawings that I started off with, these charcoal drawings on the white background, La Danse Macabre, The Dance of Death, here these animals are just floating. They are not placed in a natural habitat. They're without earth, without ground. And to me, it spoke both to the invasive species, but also to more symbolically towards Italians' relationship with immigrants. So here, deterritorialization. So this was a term that was actually uh, concocted by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. Um, and in it, they, they talk about how basically, uh, yeah, I'll read it. The process by which a social relation called a territory has its current organization and context altered, mutated or destroyed. So then these new components, they create a new territory which is a process called re-territorialization. Um, this term has been used a lot in different, in shifting social cultural processes. I have used it in the terms, in the context of art and of these animal bodies, a deterritorialization. And I think we're seeing that happening more and more. We also see it, of course, in languages and traditions. Um, this was Sensa Terra Cats. So again, it's without earth, without ground. I took the same concept, but you can see there are three cats that are falling or floating on the right. Those were street cats. They were strays that I found in Montreal um, that I, well, at the time I didn't, I was biking around the city and would just pick up the animals and kind of put them in my bike basket. And then the cat that's, you know, placed on the plaid uh, plinth, uh, that was, his name was Stripe. And Stripe was a domestic cat who had a collar and a name. And here I'm also talking about deterritorialization. We have these two species that are occupying the same space, which is the city, but in very different territories that are constantly being redefined. Um, this is just a great quote from John Berger. So in the past, families of all classes kept domestic animals because they served a useful purpose. So we have guard dogs, mice killing cats, etc. The practice of keeping animals regardless of their usefulness. So the keeping of pets is a modern innovation. And on the social, social scale in which it exists today is unique. It is part of that universal, universal but personal withdrawal into the private small family unit decorated or furnished with mementos from the outside world, which is such a distinguishing feature of consumer societies. So it's really talking here about the animal as object, that these domestic creatures become part of our material consumer lifestyle. And we do see domestic pets are kept uh, more and more in societies of, let's say wealth, um, rather than, you know, often than animals that are just kind of living in the villages or on the streets as strays. Um, this is a close up of the, the three cats, the falling cats. And that's Stripe with his mouse. Um, this then pushed me into a series I call Habitat which was um, working with roadkill. And then I also noticed that uh, not only was roadkill considered city garbage, but uh, at the same time, you know, we live in a, a very consumerist based society where technologies, old TVs, uh, radios, they go out of style every few years. Our landfills are full of old appliances. Um, and I was trying to imagine like what this idea of a natural habitat doesn't seem to exist anymore. There are manufactured habitats now for other non-human animals. And so I was imagining what it would look like 
if these creatures were living, uh, if the dioramas, let's say, their natural habitats were actually within these technologies. So uh, this is an old, I don't know, 1980s TV. I don't know if many of you were around back then. I remember TVs like that. Um, this was a chipmunk. Uh, actually, unfortunately, I'm the one who hit this chipmunk in my car. I didn't mean to, but I did. And he uh, now lives in this little radio. Um, this is another, this is a squirrel. I created a diorama. So the background is actually a photograph that I placed in the same way that uh, dioramas are built to museums. The backgrounds are uh, sort of semicircular. And this is, it, this is a, a modern still life, I call it. Um, we've of course heard of the plastics that are collecting in the ocean, et cetera. And I was kind of imagining what kind of habitat that would make for the, this little mouse who's uh, floating in a tin can on his trash island with a taxidermied fish as well. Um, this piece is called Takeout. It's a, a little weasel. Again, I'm thinking of this idea of object, of food, of product. Um, it's in a styrofoam container, um, garbage, what we consume. And this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is called In Style. Um, this was inspired, I saw, I a video, I think, of a squirrel that had gotten its head stuck in a can and people were finding it hilarious that this squirrel couldn't get this can off of its head as it was diving for food. And I was really struck by the humiliation of this creature. Um, there's obviously some comedy here as well, but it's, it's pointed. And then of course, another big TV with a raccoon. This is still part of the Habitat series. Um, so as I'm progressing in, the, in my work, I've gone, I've been doing these drawings. I've been working with taxidermy. I've been thinking a lot about Habitat and diorama. Um, my work started to shift a little bit more towards uh, these bodies, essentially. Um, so, I've spoken to you about deterritorialization um, and about the Natural History Museum. I was then starting to think about story and myth. And this was where my early education of theology, I think, started to come back and inform the work that I was doing. Uh, so Jacques Derrida, uh, philosopher, of course, he um, that which we call animal. So, Derrida said that language is the most violent separating factor between that which is called human and that which is called animal. And so he believed that by lumping together all of the other species and labeling them as animal was incredibly lazy and dismissive. And it fell short of representing the diversity between various species. A horse is not a shark. <laughs> a human is not a horse. So this got me thinking about language. Um, this is an installation that I did called The Animal That Therefore Am. Um, so this is really, I don't know, I'm sure all of you actually are familiar with cat memes. Um, so I'm just gonna check my notes here, sorry. Um, Basically, animals have been anthropomorphized in literature and pop culture since the time of Aristotle. Um, but we've really seen a reemergence on the internet with uh, cat language and cat memes. Um, the cat has become a representation of, of wasting time. And um, the language, so the animal that therefore I am, it's been translated into LOL cat speak. Um, LOL cat speak is an internet language 
Um, it was invented, oh gosh, I don't know, I guess a decade or, or more ago. Um, I have many of you might be familiar with seeing a meme of a cat coming through a ceiling. He's called ceiling cat. And these cute little memes of cats speaking this language. Um, so again, this, this entire language was evolved and devoted to online browsing. Um, what I did in this installation is you see there's a pile of salt and salt to me is it's such a powerful symbol. Um, salt was used obviously as a preservative in the taxidermy process. It's what halts uh, the decomposition of skin. It's used in the tanning process. In history, salt was a very precious commodity. And it also has a very strong place in myth and storytelling. So what I did is I kind of, I dissected the cat meme and I put a cat skin on a pile of salt. And in the background on a plinth, there's a screen with a quote from the Bible written in LOL cat speak language. So it's the quote in Genesis where Lot's wife looks back and is transformed into a pillar of salt. So it says, but Lot's wife not listen. She looked back at home place and now has a flavor. Flavor is salty. Lot's wife turned to salt, LOL. Um, so this chosen Bible verse is from Genesis when Lot's wife uh, looks back at Sodom. And therefore Lot's wife, it, she represents curiosity and the incapability of leaving the material world behind. Moving on from that, I, had, I was now less precious about these animal bodies and I was now working with skin and salt and symbolism. And I was really thinking about the futility again of, of recreating these animal bodies and making them look perfect which got me into the idea of, of negative aesthetics. So instead of, of finishing the animal to look perfect or alive, I was thinking about the idea of abject objection and uh, how we regard ugliness and beauty in our culture. This was a series of birds that I, I did. These were birds I'd collected, birds who had flown, that had flown into windows in Montreal um, and in the country. Uh, I had been collecting them and instead of recreating these perfect birds that looked alive, I was working with polyurethane foam and mixing them so they became these sort of strange, monstrous, yet colorful, delightful creatures, almost taken over by this, this other material. Um, it's polyurethane that I dyed with different, different colors. This is an example of a, a city pigeon. I was also using steel wool. Um, and it was a real departure for me from the constraints, the rules that my initial uh, research in taxidermy had kind of had uh, essentially taught me. So throughout this work, I was really engaging with uh, taxidermy. I was engaging with these animal bodies. I was engaging with the, the cultural surroundings, the political surroundings. But I was making, I, I felt this passion to, to be creating these, these artworks, these objects, um, I hadn't taken the time to really understand my own personal connection this beyond, you know, the, the childhood curiosity of other creatures. Um, and it wasn't until I, I actually, I did a series of collages and I published a book that I understood that there is something therapeutic in this process of mending these broken bodies. Um, I work with roadkill. And as you can imagine, when I'm picking up, I'm working with an animal that has suffered a very traumatic end. 
and so it's 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 broken it's the bones are are in, in pieces uh there are rips and tears and organs where they shouldn't be and i take care in cleaning them and in sewing them up and then putting them back together um, it wasn't until I did this writing that I realized that that was symbolic of some work I had to do in my own personal history and life. So The Hunting Lodge was a book that I published. It was a series of collages and some short uh, pieces of writing. And it was really looking into the connection between possession and domination, uh, sex, the hunt, and our connect or disconnection with other non-human animals. And what came out of this writing was some very personal uh, experiences that I had had. I, when I was about 13 years old, I was date raped. And so it was a very violent introduction to uh, sexual intercourse for me. I was a young woman. I didn't tell anyone. It was something that I kept secret for many years until I wrote this book. And it was in writing this that I suddenly realized, holy shit, you know, I've been working all this time with these animals and really I've been working with myself. I've been mending this sort of past trauma. Um, and that was a real epiphany for me. Um, I, I remember speaking to some colleagues and to them, it almost seemed obvious. To me, it hadn't been obvious. I was so engaged in my own work I hadn't had the perspective of stepping back and seeing how it mattered personally. Um, so these are just two short examples of some of the writing in the book. The one on the left is a description of the rape, which I, I will read to you. Uh, it's called First Date. He hisses in my ear and tells me to shut up. A string of his saliva clings to my earlobe. His hand is pressed hard against my mouth while the other tears at my clothing. An elbow crushes my ribs. With each thrust, I feel my teeth shred the tissue of my lower lip. I try to shake his hand away, but he pushes down harder, shoving my cheek deeper into the wet earth. I imagine my jaw splintering into a thousand pieces. The pain succumbs to numbness. I stop struggling and turn my gaze upwards towards the playground. Over the top of the ridge, I watch a group of old men play bocce in the park. The other one on the right is a poem I wrote. Um, Sally Dames is a very famous bird taxidermist. And when I first started studying taxidermy, I watched a few of her videos and she was a very well put together woman with very red nails. And uh, this is a poem I wrote. So it says white table, White walls, white goose, red nails. White skin, white sweater, white goose, red nails. White feathers, white knife, white goose, red nails. Red blood, red nails, red goose. Red, white, goose. And these are more of these collages that I had. So the book itself was it was plenty of collages about sexuality, animals, the hunt, gender dynamics, and then mixed in with these uh, short, pithy writing. These are more examples of the collages. Um, which then brings me to um, another point of departure, which was myth and storytelling. Um, so I've spoken to you already about, I talked about the salt and uh, certainly the storytelling there and how it relates to our culture today. I think myth and storytelling, as ancient as they may be, still uh, have a place in our world today. Um, and some of the myths that have interested me in my research, my work, have been the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a very early Sumerian myth. Um, it's the first documented written myth. It was written in cuneiform on, a, on clay tablets. Um, the myth of Agrius and Aureus, which I will go into in further detail in a minute. 
uh, as well as Artemis, who is the goddess of the hunt and childbirth. Um, she is representation of death and of a life giver. Um, and then Dionysus, Dionysus, who uh, was the god of, of grapes and the harvest and winemaking and revelry. Uh, so, and ecstasy as well. The fun one. Um, so this was a work that I did. Uh, it's a sculpture. I, again, I'm moving for a bit further away from the actual represent taxidermy representation. I'm still using the, the medium. So I still have a skin here. This is a bear skin. Um, but I am now mixing it with more sculptural practices like plaster and installation work as well. Um, just going to find my notes here. So yeah, this is, uh, this is a representation of Agrius and Aureus. Um, they were two, uh, this is a Greek myth. Um, they were two brothers who were half bear, half human. And uh, they had just exceptional strength. Hold on one second here. Exceptional strength um, and were too much for the gods and humans to handle. And so eventually they were transformed into birds. It was the only way to save them and others from total destruction. Um, this was the installation view. You can see the wall with a, a peephole or a viewfinder looking in. There's a bird on the plinth, which is representative of what they were turned into. And then of course the sculpture itself, which is the two brothers wrestling in this bear. I called it backyard because I was trying to think of how we can bring these myths into sort of our modern lexicon or modern culture. That's a close up of the, the dueling brothers. Um, this is Artemis. Uh, she again created out of uh, it was a foam structure, carved uh, foam structure, and then uh, deer antlers. Her nipples are made of mouse hides, and she has a pelt of muskrat um, around her vulva, as you can see here. So this is, again, it's moving away from the traditional animal form. It's moving into a more sculptural practice, looking at myth in the context of the gallery. Um, Venery, Venery was the title of the, the rest of the show I'm going to show you. It's, uh, Venery both means the act or the art of hunting. It also is the pursuit or indulgence in sexual pleasure. Um, in my research and my experiences with taxidermy, I of course met many hunters, especially in the United States and in Canada. And these are hunters that just find hunting thrilling. They don't necessarily hunt because they want food. They hunt because they want to kill. And they want to kill the biggest and the best creature that they can find. And what I found really um, fascinating but shocking as well was the language that was used to describe the hunt was very much the same language used um, it's, it was the same language that I would imagine people describing uh, the pursuit of a woman uh, or male, but it's, it's most, it was a very gendered language. Um, for example, antlers are called racks. Um, in, in English, you also call a woman's cleavage a rack. You want a woman with a big rack. You want a deer with a really big rack. Um, listening to them describe the anticipation, the stalking of an animal, and then waiting, finding, seeing the animal, and then the ecstatic release when the trigger is pulled. It was as if I was listening to them describe an orgasm. And that juxtaposition of death and sex and domination and possession, this violent language intermingled together, I, I found really fascinating. Um, and that was then the subject of the next work, which was called Venery. So this was essentially a diorama, but it was enclosed in a box and it had peepholes that the viewer could look through. 
And when you look through the people, you would see different um, parts of the diorama. So I've got a mannequin, the raccoon from the Habitat series, bridal Barbie. This was what it looked like on the inside. So the background is one of the collages. And then of course I had created this kind of hunting sexual diorama space. Um, on top of the TV, of course, some porn. And to me, it was really the, the well, voyeurism, which was the people. So it was the practice of, of gaining sexual pleasure from watching others. Um, looking through the peoples was not only, it was voyeuristic, but it was also, uh, to me, it harked back to what it, it's like looking through uh, the people of a gun, for example. So what hunters, how hunters see the world, they're looking through their, their gun. And the enjoyment, the enjoyment of seeing pain or distress in others. So voyeurism is both gaining sexual pleasure in sexual acts, but it's also enjoyment in pain. And again, that to me was so descriptive of this hunting culture. Um, these are, this is another view of the show, uh, the book, The Hunting Lodge is there as well as some rough sketches. This was really just showing process work, sketches of the sculpture of Artemis and then uh, these taxidermied creatures that I had almost dismembered. So there's a squirrel that's cut in half and a bunny and they still have the pins stuck in them. Um, and again, we see the salt uh, the salt has come back. So I have it in these hunter's boots and it's spilling out onto the floor um, as well as a hat, uh, which says I hunt whitetail all year round. And there's a picture of a deer as well as a woman's ass. Um, I have seen this quote on people's trucks in Western Canada. Um, people take great pride in comparing women's bodies to these, these animals. Um, I was really into this idea of the people, the, the, the voyeuristic side. This was more tongue in cheek. This was a playful installation that I did in a building in Montreal for an art festival. Uh, it was inspired by a poem by William Blake. And in it, it's a, it's a closed room. Again, you have to look through a window or people's when you look through the window, there's a raccoon that's pointing directly at the viewer. Um, and if you peek to the right, you can see a hidden space with an owl. And um, it was more, it was, a, it was a play on this idea of who's looking at who, um, who's on the outside, who's on the inside, which was uh, similar to, I think the way we feel looking at, at zoos we're there to observe these animals, but they're observing us back from within these enclosures. So this is the poem that it was inspired by. When you look through the peoples in this work, um, I place the animals right in front of the actual uh, holes so that when you're looking in, you're actually being looked back at. Um, and so there's this strange feeling of being observed while observing. So you can see we've got these other creatures that are just there on the other side saying hello. Um, the final people, when you look through it, you can actually see yourself. And that's because I had installed security cameras. So again, it was playing with this idea of the zoo of observing other animals. I think as human animals, we often tend to think that we are the ones observing. We are the powerful dominant uh, animal. And yet we forget that we too are being observed. It's just not through the same lens. I've covered this actually. Um, which now brings me to where I'm at now. And <laughs> you guys can see me. I'm actually sitting in front of this uh, idea board. Um, what I decided to do now and over the last few years is to work on a massive project, um, which is that I, 
I've combined my passions, which are uh, writing and performance. I also, I am a singer and performer. I've been in theater um, and taxidermy and sculpture. Um, and I've written an opera and I'm now trying to figure out how to make this grand opus come to life. And it's been full of challenges because instead of having an object, a finished piece, a tangible piece done in a short period of time, I'm working on something that is, it's all about research and prep. And there isn't that immediate uh, satiating quality to a finished piece. And that has forced me to go into some very difficult, dark places uh, in my personal life. Um, as we all have been through, COVID was an especially trying time. And here I was in my studio thinking, this is great. I now have all of this time to just concentrate on my fabulous opera. But what happened was I was alone in this studio with all of these grand ideas, bigger than I had ever, ever, ever thought of before. And it just crippled me. And it slowly uh, eroded my, my self-confidence. Uh, and I, I, I started to, I, I found myself in complete paralysis at one point, not knowing how to actually move forward with such a huge project. Um, and I think part of so the artisan process, the zoo. So the project is called the zoo. Um, and it's really, it is, again, it's coming back to, it's an autobiographical fantasy opera. Um, and it really is, it's been difficult for me too, because it's, they're new mediums that I'm exploring. So I'm getting into video work. I was playing with stop motion. And I think what happened is I, forgot to allow myself the time to play and to just chill for a minute and and get these to discover these new mediums i personally i think i put so much pressure on myself to have this finished product i didn't allow the generosity of time it's hard to learn a new medium especially when one is used to another and it takes time. And I, it took me a long while to get to this point where I'm now allowing myself that time to get acquainted with video, to play, to figure out these ideas, to remove the pressure of having to have this finished piece now, now, now. And so I wanted to talk about that, the artist's shadow, um, dealing with transitional times. I don't know, among all of you, what it's been like in the last few years or even in your artistic practice. But um, I think we are all human animals and easily uh, get confronted by our own demons and shadows and, uh, and difficulties and challenges. Um, for me, a huge thing was I just kept retreating. It was also COVID and I was just, becoming more and more enclosed in my own sort of dark space, which was the studio, rather than reaching out and collaboration. I forgot how important collaboration is. Or maybe it's also just something I wasn't even that familiar with. Most of my work has been me alone with a dead creature. So it wasn't perhaps in my nature to uh, seek help or support from other colleagues. Um, and another thing that was really tackling the inner critic, um, there's that, that fear when embarking on something completely new, the fear of failure, possibly the fear of success and really having to trust that innate intuition, that initial inspiration and to trust that it's leading you into the right waters and also to accept failure if it doesn't turn out the way it should be. So these were all these are all themes that I have been working on in my personal life 
And it's been interesting to see the way that they have uh, informed my work. And I actually think this product uh, is going to be stronger because of it. Um, going to those dark places has allowed me to, to also approach the work from a different perspective. Um, but before I got there, there's also the wounded artist. So we go to these dark places. I spoke of Dionysus earlier, who is the god of, of wine and indulgence. And certainly that's been a world that I have thoroughly enjoyed, but ultimately too much. And what happened in COVID was also um, a dance with addiction. Um, it was very easy to get overwhelmed by this project and to turn to, to substances. Um, so that was, and you know, it was one of those things that I think, especially in addiction, there's a lot of shame that's attached to it. Um, we tend not to talk about it the way that we should. And it's only recently that I've really been speaking to other colleagues who have had similar experiences. Um, I think, especially in the art world, there's something about the, the Dionysus effect that artists are, are open-minded explorers, substances has, have always played a role, I think in the artist's life, um, but it's a, it's a tight, it's a tight rope. So it's one that I, I, I crossed and I'm now back uh, after a, a bit of a dark battle with it. Um, but what this brings me to is it's really made me think a lot about the process of alchemy. And in alchemy, you know, there's playing with material. Alchemy is transforming a mineral into gold. That's the ultimate uh, goal. And in the process of alchemy, there's the playing with the materials. You reach a stage which is called negredo. And negredo is when this, this stone, it's, it's a lump, it's a black lump, it's coal. And that coal is either going to then turn into gold or it's just going to disintegrate and remain as coal. And I've been thinking a lot about this process and embracing both sides, embracing the negredo, embracing that coal and trusting that if it stays coal, that's part of it, you start again with the playing or you push through the negredo and end up with this, this piece of gold. I just wanna show you some videos. This is some of the stop motion work that I've been working on. I do wanna give a little warning in that it does show an animal with its skin coming off. So if there are people who don't feel comfortable seeing that kind of content, I would suggest to turn the screen off. Um, but this is some stop motion with uh, some cats. I'm just gonna show you. So again, this almost comes full circle back to La Danse Macabre, the dance of death. Um, oops, hold on. <laughs> I have another one here. These animals that are, that are taking their skin off, dancing with it, and then putting it back on. And I've got one more here. Oops, one second. There we go. And in these videos, I find a certain sweetness with it. Um, to me, they're really representative. Again, this dance of death, this fine line that we walk between life and death and the beauty and the macabre in it. So I've spoken about alchemy here. And I'm gonna leave you with this image of my falling foam cat. Um, I'm definitely open to any questions that you have. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. 
<laughs> okay, thank you very much for this. It was amazing to hear you. Um, I think that I've seen you a lot of times, but I haven't had the pleasure of hearing you deeply. And it's been really amazing. Thank you very much for your generosity and your openness and your I don't know for everything. Thank you very much. Gracias. Avalokita and from everyone. <laughs> si quieren hacer eh, alguna pregunta, eh, algún comentario, si se sienten cómodas haciéndolo en el chat en español y nosotros nosotras les hacemos le hacemos la traducción a Kate o eh, Siéntanse libres también de prender sus micrófonos, este es su espacio. I don't know if I can see that. Okay. Nada. <laughs> Están en shock. <laughs> A ver, Alfredo, carita, ¿qué quieres También está ahí, sé que es la, la curadora de la exposición en, en la que estás ahora en Oaxaca. Pues igual no sé si él se quiera preguntarte algo también. Igual si quieren prender sus camaritas para que Kate tenga la oportunidad de conocerlo. Eh, pues siéntanse cómodos de hacerlo. Hola, ¿me escuchan? Sí, bienvenida. Sí, sí, sí. ¿Me escuchan? Sí. Ah, súper. Bueno, estaría súper chido. Eh, pues nada, antes que nada, muchas gracias por haber este, dado esta charla tan maravillosa y tan profunda acerca de tu trabajo. Y... Creo que una de mis preguntas es respecto a la muerte. ¿Cuál es tu, tu relación um, más allá del arte? O sea, como que esta relación con los cuerpos de los animales y darles vida y otra resignificación. Pero tú, o sea, me, me interesa mucho saber para ti si interesa si existe algo más allá de la muerte y cómo sería tu concepción artística después de la muerte okay. I think I understand the question but I would love it to be translated just in case to make sure I, I I've got it properly um, sure so I don't, yeah uh, we First of all, she thank you for this amazing artist talk and for all the information and everything uh, you show uh, during it. And she asked about your relationship with death. Um, what do you think it's after uh, life? And what will be your conception of that artistically? Oh, great question. 
Excellent question. Um, there's a, a really great quote. Um, it's, I know it in French, so I'm gonna to try to think of it from French to English, but um, nothing is created, nothing is lost, everything transforms. Um, my belief of death is, is that material, there's nothing lost in the universe, that our energies, our bodies, etc., they just become something else, something different. They're used uh, as another material. Um, that's the, the physical. Um, I believe also that energy is a really important force for good. And I really believe in putting out positive energy into the world. And I believe the more we live with positivity and love and optimism, I believe that when we die, that that material also gets put back into the universe in a way that is constructive. Um, what's interesting about my belief of death and material is I work in a practice that ultimately halts that process. Um, these animals that I find that are dead on the road, I'm picking up and I'm fixing them in a state. And it's something that I actually really struggle with in my own work, because I question, I question this idea of, of object making and art making using these bodies. I believe that in the process, I am imbuing them with respect and in a way this new life um, the process itself is intimate, but ultimately they still become objects. So I wonder, I wonder about my place, my human animal footprint there and what it has to do, how it, how it maybe interferes with that process of, of death. Have I answered the question or is there more? Sí, sí. Ok. Muchas gracias, Kate. Y también, gracias. ¿cuál sería como tu consejo? O sea, ¿cómo, ¿cómo crees que se podría llevar un duelo en vida? O sea, como tu relación del duelo hacia el arte, como ¿cuál sería tu consejo a partir de tu experiencia al trabajar alrededor de todo esto? Um, again, I think I understand half, but I want the translation yeah. just in case. Uh, she's talking about the process of grieving and what will be your relationship or your process in your artwork, but also like your advice with it or how, how you envision it for your artwork. It, for the process of grieving? Yeah. Amazing question. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I really embrace grief and loss in my own life. Um, I cry a lot and I believe that part of, of life and living is experiencing all of the pain that and suffering that is part of the, the human experience. I feel immensely for the bodies that I work with. I, there isn't a single animal that I don't work with that I don't feel some connection to because to me, every life is precious. And when I'm working with a cat, I'm thinking about not just these animals, I'm thinking about the human animals that are also suffering. Um, I think working so closely with death has, it's brought me closer to life in that sense. You know, I really, I, I grieve and I celebrate life and death. Um, in my own life, I've experienced quite a bit of loss and 
Um, and I think that the mourning period, the, the grief, it's not only respectful to that person or that whoever is lost, is dead, but it's also, it's part of that, again, feeling that our own mortality, our own closeness to death. Um, mixed with that, that grieving process that I feel, I also, um, there's a side to, at least to taxidermy that I find almost triggers the supernatural uh, kind of witchcraft uh, mysticism in me. I, every time I approach an animal at the table, I'm almost fearful that it's going to come to life again. <laughs> Even if it's an animal that has been in my freezer for two months, I'll put it, it will defrost, it's on my table and making that first incision, I'm looking at it, almost expecting it to turn its head and wake up. And so it's, to me, it's strange. It's, um, there's this scientific approach that I have. And then there's this also, there's more of the, the witchy magical aspect that I have in me clearly. Um, and these two kind of dissect in the process. Um, yeah, but grieving is a, it's so important. It's such an important part of the process. And as I spoke about in my talk, I realized that the work I was doing in working with these bodies, in sewing them back together, in cleaning them, um, it was symbolic. I felt like I was also healing myself in the process. Every time I close a wound, I'm closing my own as well. Thank you so much, Kate. That's so beautiful. You make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so, so beautifully so. I, I, I'm so happy to uh, work with your art. So thank you so much. Thank You're you. an amazing woman. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have also a, a question, Kate. Yeah. Um, and I feel very connected with your process and, and, and with all your all your work. Um, and also with that thing uh addictions. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't take drugs or used to take drugs or alcohol a lot, but I was um I used I had a period of, of anorexia in in my life and I think it was a way of being um addicted to like it was my way of of I don't know running from this fear or something and and at the end of the of your presentation you talk about that inner self-esteem or something that it's inside you that is helping you now um, to go beyond all those um, probably those emotions that you used to have or you're still having and I would like to know how are you building or or how how are you working with with going into that into that insight uh, and into that alchemy that you're proposing, like how how can we do that? <laughs> that's I mean that's the question, right? Is uh, the thing about I'm, and you're absolutely right. I mean, body bulimia, anorexia. It is it's a there's it, it's an addiction as well. They they have addictive qualities. Um, and again, it's also very, it's body related. It's trying to find control in this physical, the physical aspect when really what is out of control is the inner, the inner life, the inner person. And what I understood about my own addiction was it was, I wasn't facing the shadows. I was 
fearful of the shadows. So I was turning my back um, instead of turning around and shaking hands with all of the ghosts. And I realized that, I mean, it's a terrifying process to do, to be that vulnerable with yourself. And it can be a very lonely process. Um, so I'd say the first thing that really helped was finding community. This is why, you know, there are support groups for addicts and for people with, with eating disorders. Um, but secondly, understanding that the more I turned around and shook hands with these ghosts, the more they became familiar to me and then less scary. So it was as, as if I was, I was shaking hands with them and I was shining a flashlight on them at the same time. And ultimately, and I still, I have to do that every day. This isn't a process that just, it's not like an epiphany that just happens. It's a daily practice. I still catch myself in moments where I'm turning my back and I'm running and I have to force myself to stop and turn around and enter those dark spaces. Um, so that's one of them is facing the fear, facing the discomfort um, and also talking about it because so much about, uh, you know, these, these challenges that we face, these inner, inner world, inner critic, inner world problems, we keep to ourselves because there's so much shame that is attached to them. And that shame is, is I think the biggest monster of all, because then we're not speaking our truth. And I find when I speak my truth, when I'm honest about it, that's when I actually find power. Um, the shame starts to diminish, but I still struggle with it because it's, I still, it's easy to fall back into the shame, the embarrassment. Um, you know, I think we, in our culture, we've been taught to connote addiction with uh, weakness. And it's so that's not even it has nothing to do with strength or weakness. Strength is is the ability to be honest and and face it. Um, but it's a process. It's a process. And I'm here. If anyone in this group wants to ever talk about about their shadow self, I am here. It's um, I get it. And I, I think that's the most important thing we have to just keep sharing and talking about it and shaking hands with those devils and ghosts that live within us, make friends with them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. ¿Alguien más que se quiera animar? A ver, Alfredo, tienes tu último champú. Hola. Hola. Este, pues no, no, no era tanto una pregunta, solamente eh, como cosas que pensé cuando estaba hablando de su trabajo. Eh, me, me acordé al principio que hablaba del, bueno, de la muerte y, y los animales eh, que encontraba en la carretera, como de un proceso... Pues, o yo, yo lo pensé como un proceso inverso, este ritual tibetano que hay de, como de que lavan a un cadáver, al cadáver pues, de tu familiar lo lavas, lo entregas como al sepulturero o el equivalente a, allá y este lo descuartiza y lo ofrece a los buitres para que los buitres lo coman y pues como son animales sagrados porque vuelan por todas las montañas, pues es como si ese cuerpo pues hiciera eso, ¿no? Como de volar. Y 
bueno, lo relacioné por, por los animales, o sea, como por esa relación de la muerte y los animales, y también como por la familiaridad que me imagino has adquirido con, con relación a los a la manipulación del pues sí de cuerpo sin vida eh, y que justo creo que ocupan como bueno en este ritual tibetano lo ocupan también para eso no como para ver al cuerpo no como pues como la persona muerta, sino como un contenedor vacío, ¿no? Como que lo que contenía ya está en otro lado. Eh, y, y eso, eso. Yeah. Can we get yeah. Yeah. He's, he's talking about, well, He's more than asking, he's like referring to something that he remember where, where, while you were giving your talk. And he remembered this Tibetan ritual about the death, that when someone uh, familiar to you dies, you wash your body and you give it to the person in charge to take care of it. And he cut it in pieces and give it to the vultures because in Tibet, Uh, uh -huh. Vultures are sacred animals because they take care of, they fly all around and also like they take care of these uh, bodies to that it's supposed to like basil carry uh, the, the soul and mind. Um, the transition of it like in, in, from, from, the, from life to death. Um, so he is uh, thinking about these while listening to you and he, he wants to know if, if there is something that resonates with you. Yeah, uh, vultures are some of my favorite birds for that reason. Um, and it's so interesting that in more Western cultures, I think because of Western Hollywood films, again, vultures represent fear because they they are the eaters of death essentially but mm -hmm. their spiritual significance is just that they are they eat the dead matter and they they transform it like i was saying nothing is created nothing is lost everything is transformed and so in that sense vultures are these creatures that almost live in both worlds they live in they're they're the creators and they're also the the eaters of, of death essentially um which i think is just really really beautiful um so yes it resonates with me and also this idea of transforming matter their mm -hmm. their their hand in transforming that matter it's yeah thank you that's a good comment Oye, yo también quisiera preguntar. I would like to ask, because now that you say like this transformation of the body, uh, like it also makes me think about all the healing process you've been having. Uh, and how do you feel your artwork accompany you in that way? For example, I, I hear you comment in your opera project, but then after this COVID phase, like, like where where are you now where is your artwork in terms of that it's evolved in that um my approach pre-covid was i was looking at this end result i was thinking you know so much of my work up to this point has been about process And it's as if when I took on this new project, I forgot about the joy of process and instead was just thinking about this finished piece. And that's what got me stuck. And so what I've done, I'm treating it the same way that I actually treat my own personal life now and that healing, which is one step at a time rather than looking at the finished piece. Um, There's a great Japanese filmmaker whose name I can't remember, he's dead now, but he described, you know, he said, when you're climbing a mountain, you don't climb looking at the peak, you're looking, you're at each step. You take one step at a time, your focus is on the steps 
until you're at the peak. And I think that's what's changed. And so now I'm looking at this opera, I've broken it down into pieces, into steps. And hopefully I am going to get to that peak, uh, but I'm not, I'm not as overcome with anxiety about the, the destination. I'm really trying to get back to the process. Thank you, Kate. Gracias a todos. Muchas gracias. Nada más para eso, para agradecerles mucho. Muchas gracias por estar acá. Muchas gracias, Kate, por todo. Y, y bueno, a, a las personas que estuvieron acá, muchas gracias por estar acá con nosotras, conectadas. Es un placer siempre tenerlas y tenerles aquí. Y pues acuérdense de seguir nuestras redes para que sepan las, los diferentes programas que tenemos. Vamos a tener un taller muy pronto con, con Ileana Magoda para que estén ahí al tanto. Eh, como saben, todos nuestros programas son libres de, de costo. Los hacemos por donativo y pueden hacer el donativo que que estén sus posibilidades y si no pueden hacer el donativo por alguna circunstancia y quieren participar de los talleres, escríbanos y con gusto eh, vemos la posibilidad y sin ningún problema pueden acceder. Este, si quieren hacer un donativo para, para la C, para Kate, para, para lo que quieran, <ríe> les voy a pasar aquí el link de PayPal para que, para que lo puedan hacer libremente. Y pues bueno, eso, gracias también a, a la generosidad de ustedes, es por lo que este programa continúa. Entonces, pues eso, miles de gracias. Thank you very much again, Kate. We love you for I uh, love you. <risa> gracias. Y pues aquí estamos. Que estén muy bien. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Chao. Bye. <risa>